In the wake of the referendum, you said that Fianna Fáil should stop listening to NGOs and the quote-unquote woke gallery. I'm wondering what you meant by that and if you could expand on that a little bit. Well, what I mean is that basically, basically there's a, a section of the of, of, of opinion out there, section of commentaries out there called, I would call them the illiberal left, who are proposing all sorts of crazy things which are logically following on from some of the theories they have. I mean, those things mean nothing to my supporters in Limerick and the people I expect to vote for me. And the people who, ex who I expect to vote for me and I hope, who I hope will vote for me in the next election, they want things like law and order, they want proper, uh, 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 fair and equitable taxation system, they want us to reduce inequality, all those sorts of things. They want extra investment in education, all the things that Fianna Fáil have been traditionally associated with. Uh, we seem to have gone a bit distant from those, uh, at least the perception is, and as you know, in, in politics, perception is everything really. Truth is only an occasional troublesome interloper. Uh, so, so, so people keep saying that to me. I mean, it, 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 it struck me very forcibly. Uh, during the referendum campaign <coughs> because most of the I, I was out canvassing with our local election candidates and our European election candidates and when the referendum was announced the only reaction I got initially was people saying to me, well, what does it mean? Why are we having it? What, can you explain it to us? And I did. I explained it to countless people. I didn't canvass against it. I didn't canvass for it. I remained objective. But I explained it to people. But when you came to within two or three days of polling day, I was amazed at the number of people, my supporters, who came to me and said, well, you know, I don't think we'll vote at all. Or if we do vote, we'll vote no, because we're disillusioned. We're disillusioned with the party. We, we think that it has lost its identity in government and we want to see it recommit to certain things that we can support. Um, so when it comes to the issues you're describing of the illiberal left, as you put it, I presume that would include things like, for example, gender ideology. Uh, would, would I be right in saying that's the sort of thing you mean, the hate speech bill being another one? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the hate speech bill, there's no, no compelling case has been made for the hate speech bill. You see what happened in Scotland over the last few days when they passed the hate speech bill. I think there were 6,000 complaints in the first three days. I mean, to me, that's not a hate speech bill, that's a crank's chatter. And, uh, you know, I... Admittedly, admittedly, when the hate speech bill was introduced initially, maybe we didn't study it closely enough. It's very hard to be across every single piece of legislation that goes through. Uh, but when when the controversy started, when I did study it, I found that number one. Uh, there's no, I don't think there's any need for it. I think that the law is sufficient as things stand at the moment. And most of the things that are designated as hate crimes are crimes already anyway. The hate is, is an extra element and hate isn't even defined. So I think at a great deal of time, energy and, uh, you know, expertise has been expended on this now. So I think, you know, we'd have been better off sort of trying to solve the crisis in Limerick, University Hospital Limerick, put more guards in the streets, uh, be seen to stand up to young, young criminals. I mean, I proposed a piece of legislation many years ago that <clears throat> where somebody underage commits a crime which causes financial damage to a victim, that the parents of that person should be potentially be liable to compensate the victim if it can be shown that they took no, no action to control the, the, the activities of their kids. And I could point you several examples of that in Limerick at the moment. I mean, I'd probably be shot uh, at dawn now if I, if I propose something like that uh, because of, the, because of the, the view that's out there. But I think that's one of the things the government should be contemplating and I think it's one of the things that would reduce this type of juvenile crime because a lot of the, a lot of the juvenile crime that I come across, uh, it's been done in many cases for no monetary gain. It's been done because people c feel they can get away with it and they do get away with it. It's a culture of impunity and it uh. must be confronted. Um, just pivoting back to the hate speech bill though, as, as you know yourself, there are going to be people who would criticize your criticism and they would say something like, well you voted for the hate speech bill and when it comes to gender ideology, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you voted for the uh, Gender Recognition Act in 2015 as well and so what, what would you say to critics who might argue, well look Willie, you know, you can say all you want about this, is, this was a bad policy or this was a bad idea but if you're voting for all of them then how, how, how does that that criticism have legitimacy. What, what would you say to that? It was, it, the hate speech bill was was was, was uh, <coughs> pretty much rushed through the door. We didn't have. I, I I certainly didn't pay sufficient attention to it. I hold my hands up to that. I didn't pay sufficient attention to it until it was brought to my notice. But when I read it, I was absolutely horrified. That's being quite honest about it. Uh, you know, as I say, it's impossible to be across every piece of legislation. Look, taking into account the volume of legislation that's gone through here. But look, it's been debated now. The government know what the problems are. The new the Taoiseach elect himself. 
himself, Simon Harris, said it needs to be substantially amended. If, it's, if, it's, if there's nothing wrong with it, why does it need to be amended? But I think the general feeling is now that instead of amending it, that the government would be better off going back to the drawing board and leaving the hate speech bill aside for the moment and concentrating on, 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 on the bigger issues. Uh, do you think that there are many other TDs and elected representatives, senators for example, aside from yourself who feel similarly about it now, who in hindsight have regretted either voting for it or who have gotten cold feet about the whole idea? Yeah, well, I, talking to some of the people I do talk to here, my own party mainly, I mean, people are certainly, are certainly uh, hesitant, very hesitant about it now uh, because it has become a kind of a symbol of where the government is where it really shouldn't be, <laughs> if, you, if you can follow me. Uh, so I think that a lot of people, a lot of people I'm speaking to, would be very happy if the hate speech bill was con consigned to history, at least during the lifetime of this doll. Um, so then I suppose uh, on the gender ideology issue, obviously you are down uh, around Limerick, and so this, the case, the very high profile case of Barbie Kardashian, would be very close to home for you, where obviously, for those who don't know, this violent biological male who identifies as female was placed into a women's prison despite the fact that he had previous sex offences, he had threatened to rape, torture and kill uh, a woman, including his own mother, and then he ended up in a prison population with women. And so this obviously was a rather remarkable situation, and we've seen similar situations in Scotland and so on. Do you think that the Gender Recognition Act, in hindsight, was a was a mistake. That when we're seeing outcomes like this, I think yeah, I think that the, the, you know any piece of legislation, you, you know, it's impossible to see ultimately what the outcomes are going to be. But Peter Toby in a bit. Well, well, come on. I mean, that was a pretty obvious one. Like, if you if you're recognising somebody under law as male if they identify as male or female if they identify as female, like we could kind of foresee an outcome like this. I, I, well, well, I wonder, I mean, to say, you know, if, if that had occurred to anybody, I'm sure they would have uh, trusted to the discretion of prison governors uh, not, to put to, not, not, not to mix the, 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 the former male with the present females. But there is legislation which actually Padre Tobin drafted, which I, I'm one of the signatories of that. I was one, one of the ten signatories to get that brought in here so as to prevent that sort of thing happening in future. I mean, I'm coming across this uh, similar type of cases where, you know, single sex uh, changing rooms and football pitches and nobody can define a woman anymore i mean it's 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 got simply gone too far and it it does not represent it does not represent the views of the people who send me here to legislate and i have to represent those view, their views um, so do you think there's an appetite within government to change that do, do, again is is it your view um that there, there is a, a lot of trepidation about these issues? Do people realise that they're as controversial as they are? Well, yes. I mean, they've got a great deal of uh, airtime now. And I think people do, do. I mean, looking at some of the statements that came out from the Fine Gael Ardesh and some of the, uh, some of the uh, interviews on the record and off the record with Fine Gael backbenchers, uh, they, they, they see, the recognition seems to be slowly dawning. And uh, I think a lot of our people recognise it too. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say yes is the answer to that, yes. Um, I, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know you're very busy and I appreciate your time. Um, I, I was speaking to a Fianna Fáil councillor recently who uh, said he had left the party and he had become independent. I think he's actually since joined the Independent Ireland Party. And I, I was just speaking to him generally about his perspective on politics. And he was saying that he basically doesn't know what Fianna Fáil's identity is in the modern era. That, you know, several decades ago, that would have been very obvious. And I, I was even saying how there are certain political parties who, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, you kind of understand what niche they're trying to fill. You know, p people before profit, they're very uh, staunch socialist. I get it. The Green Party, they're staunch environmentalist. I get it. What is Fianna Fáil in the modern day, so far as you're concerned, and what should it be? Well, in the modern day, I mean, it's, it's, uh, for the past four years since we've been into government, it's uh, difficult to identify anything in particular they stand for. I mean, okay, I mean, we, we, I suppose we're still identified as, as, as being in favour of more housing, more public housing, and the numbers have gone up, not sufficiently as yet, but the, the plan is in place and it'll be possible to ramp it up. Uh, but the, 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 the original ethos of Fianna Fáil was to promote economic growth and make sure that the fruits of that growth were distributed equitably throughout the whole community. Uh, that's what Fianna Fáil traditionally stood for. Now, if that's what Fianna Fáil still stands for, we have to make that clear to the people between now and the next election, and the window of opportunity is, is, getting, uh, is closing literally by the day. Um, 
la last question. Do you have any prediction for how you think the upcoming uh, elections are going to go? Obviously, uh, it's uh, it's a tough one to call, but given given everything that's going on at the minute, do you, do you have any idea how how things might pan out? I, I wouldn't. I, it's it's two months to go. I wouldn't predict it as early as this. But I mean, I, I was quite taken aback by my experience in the referendum, which I I, I just explained to you, and. Uh, I'm afraid. I mean, the reaction in the door is quite quite good. I mean, it's it, it contrasts with 2011, where you were literally afraid to press the doorbell because you didn't know what was going to come back on the other side. Now people are quite uh, they're quite uh, welcoming. They're, they're they're prepared to engage and all that. But one wonders, you know, how many of those nice Doctor and Mister Jekylls are going to turn into Mister and Mrs Hyde once they go into the polling station. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Deputy. Really appreciate your time.